Hello and welcome to Mechanical Ventilation Basics. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. Hopefully I can make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's talk a little bit about the terminology that's used when we're talking about mechanical ventilation. So this diagram here will help us to hopefully be able to understand a little bit better what these different terms mean. So let's kind of walk through what the diagram is first. As you take a look at the diagram, you'll see that we have some different areas in here, four different areas to be exact. Across the middle, we have the tidal volume. Then underneath that, we have an expiratory reserve and finally a residual volume at the bottom. Up toward the top, we have that inspiratory reserve. So now let's walk through what these things mean. As you walk through the middle here in the tidal volume, that's the volume of air that you're breathing in and out as you just sit here and breathe at rest. Now, if you were going to go out and you were going to run a marathon, you would need to have more air movement to have more gas exchange, get rid of more CO2, bring in more oxygen. So we have both an inspiratory and an expiratory reserve for those purposes so that you can breathe in more deeply and breathe out more deeply as well and have those big breaths that are necessary in order to move the air that would be uh, necessary to be able to exercise like that. So that's what the inspiratory reserve is for. Deep breath. That's your inspiratory reserve. Okay, now blow out all the air that's in your lungs. And when you blow it all the way out until you can't blow out anything more, that's your expiratory reserve. We cannot exhale the residual volume. If we did, then all the alveoli would kind of slam closed and then we'd have a real hard time getting our lungs to reopen again. So we don't want to be able to exhale that part. So our expiratory reserve is all the air we can blow out of our lungs, which really isn't all the air, because again, we have that residual volume on the bottom. Let's just talk a little bit about what we can manipulate showing on this diagram. One of the things that we can manipulate here is that we can either increase the volume or we can increase the rate. By doing either one, increasing that tidal volume and making that bigger, so that's like taking bigger breaths. You're moving into your inspiratory reserve. Instead of just breathing casually, naturally as you're breathing now, you're going not full complete breaths, but just a little bit deeper than you normally would. By doing so, you're going to be moving more air. And when you're moving more air, you're going to be blowing off more CO2. The other thing we can do is to increase the rate. So if we increase the rate at which somebody breathes, and this is what happens when you exercise, you breathe faster, right? By increasing the rate, you blow off more CO2. So we can increase the tidal volume, we can increase the rate, and those things are going to directly affect the CO2. The other piece that we can manipulate is down here in the bottom, the residual volume. Remember, the residual volume and usually the expiratory reserve, those two pieces are sitting in the lung all the time. So if you're not taking these maximal expiratory breaths, like going trying to push out all the air that's in your lungs. If you're not doing that, then your expiratory reserve is staying there. So when you're exercising, you're working with the top part of the diagram. You're not working with the bottom when you're breathing. The expiratory reserve and the residual volume, those two areas are going to be the parts of the lung, or the, part, the air that's in the lung, that is doing the gas exchange. So think about it this way. If we were to just do gas exchange when you took a breath in, we would only be doing gas exchange about one quarter of the time. So gas exchange has to occur continuously, and the way it does that is through the air that's down there in the residual volume and the expiratory reserve. The tidal volume simply circulates the air that's down there in the expiratory reserve and residual volume, kind of like having a fan in your room. It's just circulating the air in the room. It's not sucking it all out and replacing it. It's just circulating the air down there. Now we can manipulate that a little bit by increasing our residual volume. We do that by using PEEP or by using CPAP. 
see part two of this program for more information about the types of mechanical ventilation. So let's take a look at some of these other terms that refer that we refer to when we're talking about mechanical ventilation. One of those is peak airway pressure. So we want to be watching our peak airway pressures in our patient. If we exceed the airway or the, the ability of that airway to be able to expand and to move, we're going to pop the airway or pop parts of the lung and the patient will develop a pneumothorax. So we're concerned about peak airway pressures and we follow those on our ventilator so that we can be sure that we know how much pressure is actually occurring. One of the ventilator alarms that you hear frequently is a high pressure alarm. And the high pressure alarm goes off because we have too much airway pressure. The patient moved in bed, coughed, something like that, and set it off. Another part of the terminology that we refer to a lot is this inspiratory expiratory ratio. So here is the tidal volume, and this is just a, a normal person breathing in. Notice the sharp upsweep in the inspiratory time. And then we have a longer, more gradual expiratory time as it rolls out. So our inspiratory time is considerably shorter than our expiratory time. And if we take a look at that, and the inspiratory expiratory ratio would be the amount of time it takes for inspiration versus the amount of time it takes for expiration. And those are some components we look at. Now, if we're setting up a ventilator, we don't want to put another breath on top of that expiration. So that's why it's important that we know what this inspiratory expiratory ratio is, or that we're setting it if we're setting up a ventilator. Additional terminology that we use a lot is uh, talking about this alveolar capillary membrane. The alveolar capillary membrane in this diagram has been highlighted in yellow. So you can see it there. So just to give you a little background here, I know that this diagram is labeled, but we have an alveolus here. We have a blood vessel underneath, and you can see the blood flow, the capillary walls, all those kind of pieces. So this is one alveolus, one capillary up against that alveolus, allowing for the movement of oxygen and CO2 in and out of the vasculature and the alveolus. In and out of the alveolus. Another one of the terms that we use a lot with mechanical ventilation is this idea of fraction of inspired air, FiO2. The fraction of inspired air means the amount of oxygen that we have in the air that is going into the lungs. So our little arrow at the top there is pointing, showing us that the air is going into that alveolus, and that's what we call our fraction of inspired air. Keep in mind that this is put into a decimal and not a percentage. So if we're saying that we have 100%, that would be 1.0. 50% would be 0.5. So our fraction of inspired air is important. This is how much oxygen we are giving to the patient. Now, what we would really like to know is how much oxygen is in that alveolus, but there's no way to do that. We can't like put a probe in there and find out how much oxygen is actually in that alveolus. So we're doing the next best thing. We're saying, how much oxygen are we giving the patient hoping that that oxygen is getting down to the alveolus so it can diffuse. So now that the oxygen has diffused across that alveolar capillary membrane, it becomes PaO2. That is the amount of dissolved oxygen in the blood, PaO2. PaO2 is dissolved oxygen. So oxygen dissolves into the bloodstream first, then it hitches a ride on a hemoglobin. Now why this is important is because the PaO2, you can be looking at that number on your blood gas and say, wow, that looks great, but that's not the part that the cells use. The cells use what's attached to the hemoglobin. 
So even though this is important because we need to have an adequate PO2 in order to drive our oxygen saturation, that's the next piece, the amount of oxygen that is bound to hemoglobin, that's not the part that the cells use. So then oxygen that is dissolved in the blood, or PaO2, binds up to hemoglobin and becomes SaO2. Next, we have our dissolved carbon dioxide in the blood, our PaCO2. This is the partial pressure of CO2 in our arteries. So our CO2 is in the bloodstream as well. We're measuring this usually on the arterial side. So when we do an arterial blood gas, we're going to see our CO2 level, and that's the amount of CO2 that's left in the arterial blood before it even gets out to the tissue. Now there's some differences that occur with normal spontaneous breathing, which you're doing right now, and what happens when a patient is on a ventilator. With spontaneous breathing, air is pulled into the lungs. So you see the diagram on the left here. What it's showing is that the lungs, and we've got the chest wall here, and the chest wall expands and it pulls the lungs open. So it's like grabbing a balloon from the outside and pulling the outside of the balloon to fill the balloon with air. The diaphragm drops, chest wall expands, and now we have a negative pressure, a vacuum, inside the thorax. And that sucks air through the nose and mouth into the trachea, down into the lungs, and fills the lungs. When the patient exhales, this is a passive process. The diaphragm relaxes. Now, if you take a look at the two pictures, you can see the diaphragm is flatter during inspiration, and it's more curved during expiration. Chest wall relaxes. The negative pressure decreases. In other words, there's less vacuum, so the air travels back out. And we have exhalation. In mechanical ventilation, this is a little different now because now we have air that is being pushed into the lungs instead of pulled. So now all of the pressures in the chest will be positive. We're pushing air in. We're blowing that balloon up. We're blowing that balloon up, and now it's making all those pressures positive. This is why we must be careful with using mechanical ventilation. If we push too much air in, we'll pop the lung. Just like if you blow a balloon up too much, you'll pop it. And then expiration, again, is going to be done passively because now we have positive pressure inside the chest wall, and it's going to push that air back out again. Now, because we don't have that diaphragm working for us and the chest wall working for us, we're going to have to use PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure, to keep those alveoli open. Otherwise, they're just going to collapse. So when do we use mechanical ventilation? Two of the indications for mechanical ventilation are respiratory failure, so we have an inadequate ventilation or inadequate oxygenation. Let me give you an example of each. Inadequate ventilation occurs when a patient has maybe a blockage to their respiratory tract. For example, uh, patients with asthma and COPD, they have blockages in the airways, which decreases the amount of ventilation that they get. Ventilation is the amount of air movement. Inadequate oxygenation, then, is the gas exchange that's happening at the alveolar level. So we may have to do that if the patient has pneumonia or the patient has some other condition that is causing some disruption at the alveolar level. Uh, ARDS is another example where we have really bad oxygenation and we need to use mechanical ventilation. Hemodynamic instability. In cases where patients have heart failure, oftentimes we'll use mechanical ventilation. The positive pressure of mechanical ventilation helps to decrease venous return to the heart. Uh, also, unfortunately, decreases cardiac output, but because it has such a good effect on decreasing our venous return, it also helps to improve our cardiac function. So how do we assess that patient who is on a mechanical ventilator? Well, first of all, let's assess the patient 
first. Always assess the patient first. The machine is loud and it's going to get your attention. It's going to beep, it's going to boop, it's going to do whatever, and it's going to get your attention. You're going to go in there and see flashing lights and everything else and think, oh, I got to look at that machine. But the first thing we want to do is look at the patient. Ultimately, we can remove the patient from the ventilator and bag the patient if we need to. So ultimately, we've got an option for maintaining oxygenation in this patient while we figure out what's wrong. In the meantime, though, let's look at the patient. Check the airway. Is the airway intact? Is the ventilator maybe become uh, disconnected? Are there secretions in the airway? Does the patient need to be suctioned? All those kind of things. Look at the patient's breathing. How are they breathing? Maybe the sedation is not adequate or the patient is waking up or they're anxious or any of those kind of things. Look at their circulation. What are their vital signs like? Is there a problem? Are they starting to crash? Maybe that's part of the the uh, issue as well. And look at disability. Disability, uh, whether or not that patient is going to be able to wean from the ventilator and how well that patient is moving around in bed and those kind of things. Then you assess the machine. Take a look at the pressures. So when you look at the screen here of this mechanical ventilator, or on whatever one that your patient's on, look at the pressures, the volume, the rate. Are they what we set this ventilator up for? Are we hitting high pressure alarms, high or low volume alarms, rate alarms, etc.? And those kind of things we'd want to report back on. So again, remember assess, patient first, then the machine. Well, thank you for joining me for Mechanical Ventilation Basics. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time.